When the weather gets rough in Alaska, the Coast Guard stands ready to answer cries for help. In Kodiak, an unusually calm night seems like an unlikely time for a search and rescue. While in Sitka, the air crew is the only option for a man suffering from internal bleeding. Yeah, man, he seems like he's breathing a lot faster than he was. And when kayakers near Cordova are caught in an ice field, the Coast Guard rushes to their aid. That's definitely a significant amount of ice in the bay. This is something that we normally don't do. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here, every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. Got you airborne at this time. Zero five POB, have a safe flight. Keep me abreast. About uh, 12.38 in the AM, we got a call from district uh, letting us know that there was a 406 EPIRB uh, going off about 50 miles south of Kodiak. The 406 EPIRB, it's almost like a homing beacon that they'll carry in case the ship was to get submerged or take on water. Sometimes they just get turned on. Um, and most of the time, unfortunately, they are false alarms. Uh, but we have to respond to every one of them. So we'll try to hail the vessel any way we can. Come down on the uh, yeah, Within four miles, guys, so uh, keep your eyes open. Picking up anything on our radar? My name is George Mezzi, lieutenant here, and uh, I fly H-60 helicopters. You know, it's a fairly quick flight to get out there. And with the 1 o'clock in the morning wake up, you're trying to overcome a lot of grogginess. You've got nothing on radar. Even up till about 10 miles out, we had no radar returns whatsoever. So we had serious doubts about a vessel being out there, at least one that was still afloat. Beautiful night. It is. It's hard to believe somebody's in trouble out here. Yeah. Is that uh, something out there at 11 o'clock? Something out there? Possibly. I see uh, flashing light straight down. OK, good eyes, good eyes. That looks like something that might be in. Yeah, stamp out a mark. I think it's a raft. I started seeing debris in the water, more and more debris, and looking out the window and I see a strobe light going off. And I thought it was them, so we hovered over there, and it was three guys in a raft hanging out. We'll shoot an approach to the water here, keeping plenty of distance from the vessel. So our rotor wash is not affecting them. Cabin doors are open. When you see people on the raft, you know that something's horribly wrong. They're cold, hypothermic. Who knows what's going on? So the swimmer, he's getting his stuff ready to go, and we're all just talking about what needs to be done. All right. I would like the rescue swimmer to go down there if, uh, if you're comfortable with that. Oh, yeah. OK. I'd like to hoist you down. Okay. I'd like to get you on the radio, and I'd like to find out if all the people on that boat are in the raft. Okay. If that's determined, then great. We'll talk on the radio about how we can recover them. We'll talk about if they're injured or not, and uh, probably do basket recoveries of them. Roger. That sounds good to me. Basically decided within a few seconds that we wanted to send the rescue swimmer down to communicate with those people because if they had been in a raft out there in the dark, uh, cold seas, they could be pretty much out of it at that time. So they need uh, somebody to directly communicate with them. And it didn't sound like they had a radio. Pilot uh, Simplified the Mech did knock out a checklist, so we don't waste any time. Pretty much just brief to harness deployment to the water. I swim over to the little skiff and to assess the situation. Okay. 
provider. When I got over there, there was uh, three gentlemen. They were just in like sweatshirt and shorts, no survival equipment. We were in the radio comms with him within a minute, and we found out very quickly there was one individual out of the three that was severely hypothermic and may have had other injuries as well. And we also knew at that time that another person actually got trapped in the vessel and went down with the vessel, according to them. So we're concerned not only with the person on the raft with hypothermia, we're also concerned that there's another man in the water somewhere that uh, we don't know his location at this time. So basically what I did was uh, in the left seat, I could search with our FLIR system which is infrared, and uh, look around to try to find him while we hoisted the uh, the other survivors. I decided uh, a basket hoist would not be the smartest idea, so I radioed for this drop just because of the quickest route. Those looks good. Easy back. This guy's bare t-shirt in the water. They sent down the strap to me and put him in. You know, I didn't really want to put the guy in the water because he, he was already in bad shape, but it was the best method. There really was no other option. We, we had to put one guy in the water at a time without chancing blowing that raft over and having three guys in the water, potentially getting hypothermic from that. Uh, none of them had Gumby suits on, survival gear, nothing. So I delivered the sling to Ryan, and he hooked him up, and it brought him in the cabin as quick as we could, and started getting him warm. Friends from survivor in the cabin. Fight mech pulls us in. We put blankets on the guy in a hypo bag to keep him warm. Hold on, we're still trying to get this guy situated. I'm in the cabin still trying to get the first survivor warmed up the best that I can. Kind of like waiting. It's kind of I don't want to wait because there's more people in the raft trying to come in. But this guy needs to at least get warmed up and get some protection on him as fast as we can. So we delayed a little bit there trying to warm him up. And then I open up the cabin door and Ryan decides to do uh, rescue baskets of the last two guys. We put the rescue swimmer back down, and because these other survivors were ambulatory, they could get up and move around. Those took a matter of minutes to get both of those survivors in the cabin. Ryan put them in the basket one at a time, and we brought them up as quick as we could. Sent the sling back down and picked up Ryan and closed the cabin door, got these guys warm, put all the blankets on the first guy that we brought in. The other two guys, they seemed to be well enough to make it back to Kodiak without anything, because we had everything on this guy trying to keep him warm. Right away, I knew he wasn't well at all. We hooked up the AED on him, and it, it didn't read a pulse or anything. So I gave him the signal, should we start pumping? Should we start blowing? And he's like, yes, let's do it. So we started started CPR and just kept it up until we got back. So the call comes in, it's about midnight. When we got on scene, it was three guys in a raft. One guy was worse off than the other ones, so we started CPR and just kept it up until we got back. His airway's compromised, possibly cardiac arrest, because he's hypothermic. I get the bag valve mask out to give him some O2. Once we landed, I continued on deck until the ambulance got to the helicopter.
Once we got on deck, the ambulance drove up almost immediately to transfer this man to the hospital. We offloaded him. The other two guys, they were doing all right. I mean, as good as they can be, watching their friend getting CPR. But they walked out the helicopter on their own, minimal assistance. Got the last guy off and stretched him to the ambulance. The paramedics took over. They had warming pads and they continued CPR. Sixty maintenance, pretty officer Wilson. How can I help you? Oh, uh, he's getting his dry suit on. Yes, he's going. Is yeah. we go fine? Yeah, all right. Dressed yeah. out. Let's go. When we were on deck, we knew the first thing we wanted to do was get gas and get back on scene so we could search for the last possible survivor. The plan for you guys is to get out there and just relieve those guys. They were pumping CPR cloud. I'm not comfortable with that. Continue. There's no reason to. Yeah, plenty here. of guys are right here. You're good. We talked to Ops, who was actually up and at the air station at that time. He made the right call by saying that uh, the rescue swimmer and our flight mech probably needed to be changed out at this point because they had been working extremely hard. Both of them had been doing CPR on the way back. It's, uh, it, it weighs a lot on the mind and the body to do that kind of work. And uh, these guys, we had replacements here. We could swap them out quickly, so that's what we did. And then we went out to search for the uh, last possible survivor on scene. Not that far away, it's about 50 miles uh, south of here. We're gonna set up a uh, sector search as soon as we get out. And the thought process is, what if the guy made it out of the boat and he's hanging on to a piece of debris or something? No, it's not likely. You never know. It could be some miracle. He was wearing a gumby suit and sleep or something and popped up somewhere else. I'm AMT3 Christian Sather, a flight mech here at uh, Kodiak. I got the call at 3 in the morning. We were airborne by 3.30. The, uh, the ready pilots, the pilots were still were on the plane. I knew there was possibly still people in the water. So when we get told that all these guys were in pants and t-shirts, no survival suits, it was imperative that we got out there as fast as we could. All right, debris field is in sight. You're making my approach. I don't see the raft. Door's coming up. Hey, Mr. Massey, is this our debris field? I can't see the actual debris field. All I see is what I think is a fuel spill. But it's, it's, yeah, we were hoisting before in this area. During that search period, it was nighttime. It was difficult to see in certain areas, but we did have our infrared radar. We could look around and see if there was any kind of heat signatures in the water. We didn't see any. I don't know where the boat went, though. It's a little raft. That's a good question. Come up a little bit of the track, man. To your right, to your right, to your right. Wait, I see something up ahead. That's a whale. It's a whale. There were a couple of reflective things in the water right back there, but I mean, it didn't look like yeah. I was operating the spotlight in the back. Fuel slick was about the only thing we could really pick up. We couldn't find the raft or much in the way of uh, too much debris. We sat and looked at water. You, know, you hope for the best, you're straining, you know, you're, you're wanting to see something, but at that point, you're hoping for a miracle. And you're hoping we can be the miracle, but you know, sometimes you, there's, there's only so much you can do. We head back. Yep, we're head back. I hope that dude made it. Small chance, but you know what? It was approximately uh, 6 or 7 a.m. Um, when we departed scene because another helicopter came on scene to relieve us during the search. They continued searching, continued for the rest of that day. We did everything within our capability of doing. When you can't find them, you know how much time's elapsed. That's uh, pretty demoralizing. Humbles you that you're not always able to get there. You know, Alaska out here, it, na Mother Nature's out to get you, and uh, a lot of times it wins. Jaime had been working on the Advantage for about six months. The entire time I knew him, he'd fished, and uh, we just became friends and then ended up having two kids together. They searched for nearly 20 hours, over 1,400 miles of water. During those 20 hours was the most long 20 hours I have ever had. The waiting and the praying and waiting, hoping that someone was gonna call with something positive. But every minute and every hour that went by, my faith was growing very little. So 
of them having to call me and to call a search off was one of the hardest things I think I've ever had to hear. Because then we really knew he wasn't coming home. But for the Coast Guard, it has to be one of the hardest things for them, too, to unsuccessfully find somebody. But I thank them so much for everything that they did. out of the box stuff, but uh, I've definitely never had kayakers stuck in an ice field before, and they're like stuck in this little area and the ice is closing in around them. That's definitely a significant amount of ice in the bay. We didn't have a really good picture of what they were facing. It's a perfectly calm, beautiful, icy bay with about a billion and a half chunks of ice the size of buses floating around in it, you know? I'm Lieutenant Commander Josh Fitzgerald, C-130 pilot, Air Station Kodiak. This weekend marks the annual Crab Festival in the community of Kodiak. It's a time when everybody gets together and they have rides and games and great food and, and lots of cool activities. And we're going to go out there and do a search and rescue demonstration. So the first thing that you're going to see is the uh, flyby of the, uh, the Herc and the, uh, the 60. For this to happen, the, uh, the Herc has to fly at close to its slowest speed possible. And the, uh, the 60 is going to be uh, just keeping pace. So uh, what you're going to see next is the 860 is going to come on the far side of Near Island there and uh, perform the, uh, the hoist and rescue operation. Hi, my name is Chris Moore. I'm an aviation survival technician, second class. Usually when we do rescues, there's never anybody except for the survivors around, and it's all business trying to get it done. And this time, doing it in front of the, the uh, community here in Kodiak is it's a whole different feeling. It, you, Definitely in the door of the helicopter, excited to, you know, show them what you do. After I set the survivor up in the basket, I turned around and I waved back at the crowd, and they, the whole crowd erupted in a in a roar of cheers, it was pretty awesome. Crab Fest is a huge deal around here. I think everybody looks forward to it, especially the Coast Guard guys that come through here to get to have something like this in this small island, this small community. It made me very proud to be a rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard and do what I do. Phone call this evening uh, for medical evacuation on a seven year old gentleman in the town of Klawak. Pick up a gentleman who's got some internal bleeding, and we're going to take him over to the hospital and catch can. Troop ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Hey, Mon, as far as stuff like set up back here, do you want to, want to go ahead and set up the litter? 
Or you just want to wait and see if he's even going to be laying down? He's gone amplitory. So we're probably going to need the litter. Roger. Name is Josh Neal, third class AMT, in the US Coast Guard. Typical night on duty. Um, it's about 12.45. Heard the alarm go off. It was a guy with uh, gastrointestinal problems. Somehow he's getting blood into his stomach. So uh, we didn't really know a whole lot until we got in the air. Hey, Mullen, so the uh, GI bleed, is that just a gastrointestinal bleed, basically, is what you're saying? Yeah. So this guy's problem with losing quite a bit of blood. So okay. uh, I've been just concerned more than just know the GI bleed and treating him for shock. Roger. When you have a GI bleed, your biggest priority is getting your patient to higher care as quickly as possible. Hey, Mons, he seems like he's breathing a lot faster than he was. I was kind of going into the situation blind. Got to let your training kick in and do what you need to do. Hey, Mons, so the uh, GI bleed, is that just a gastrointestinal bleed, basically, is what you're saying? Yeah. Phone call this evening for a medical evacuation for a gentleman in the town of Klawak. He's about 70 years old and he's got some uh, medical issues. He needs to get to the hospital over in Ketchikan. So, this guy's problem with losing quite a bit of blood. So, okay. uh, I'm just concerned more than just know the GI bleed and treating him for shock. Roger. We didn't have a corpsman on this flight, so it was extra important for me and the swimmer to be on the same page. Basically, it's just me and him. So, if he needs anything, I need to know what his intentions are, what he's going to do. I want to get him in here. We'll get the light pack hooked on him, and basically, I'm just going to put a full band in him and just keep his blood pressure over 90. That's it. Drops below. All right. I'm ASD three months, stationed up here in Sitka, Alaska. I knew that this patient was going to need IVs if they weren't already given. Kind of prepared myself for the worst. Uh, basically, had everything taped to the ceiling, so I knew where it'd be. Your role as a aviation survival technician going to be to, to take control of the situation. Got to let your training kick in and do what you need to do. It's raining off to the right there a little bit. Yeah. We are firm one five minutes out from the clock. Opposite says they're on the way. So we're going to be moving around in the back. Roger, roger. Leaving Sitka, going down to uh, Kluwak, weather was OK, but uh, within about 10 to 15 miles of Kluwak in the airport itself, we got into some fairly heavy rain showers. Uh, so we're not sure if we're going to be able to get through the uh, the pass. It's the quick way over to Ketchikan. But uh, we're going to see how the weather unfolds here once we get the patient on board. Depending on how many people they have there, I might need help get this litter out. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. All right, yeah, that's fine. All right, ETA, two minutes. Once we get them in the plane, we're going to put them in a position of comfort. Um, with a GI bleed, there might be some vomiting. So All right. the, the more yeah, people we see, the more sitting up, better off he's going to be. Runway Here we are. Crew first approach. Ready for approach. We landed in Klawak and waited about five minutes for the ambulance to show up. When you have a GI bleed, your biggest priority is getting your patient to higher care as quickly as possible. Once the ambulance showed up, I jumped in the rig with the paramedics on board, talked to them about the condition of the patient. With a GI bleed, he can go into shock from loss of blood. So by administering IV, you keep his, uh, basically his, his blood volume up higher. One of the things we're very concerned about anytime we're transporting a patient is the limited care we're able to provide in the helicopter. It's obviously not a great environment uh, to perform patient care. So once we get the patient loaded, the rain actually in the area stopped. You know, make sure the patient's uh, fairly stable. We're going to get him to catch a can the, uh, the quickest way we can. Hey, Munz, he seems like he's breathing a lot faster than he was. All right, sir, Munz will be off ICS for a minute. Roger. We're about 10 minutes out, guys. En route, my biggest concern was blood pressure dropping due to the internal bleeding. The only way to really keep that up is to, to make sure that he's got a patent IV and, and keep fluid in him to keep his heart rate up. All right, he wants to sit up. We're about five minutes out. Munz, just hold on one second. I'll, uh... I'll grab you something to put behind him. Based on the patient's vitals and his general impression, he was uh, pretty stable. Um, he had verbally told me that he was more comfortable in a sitting position, so we sat him up. But besides that, it was mostly just uh, monitoring him in flight until we landed in Ketchikan. We landed there, Munz got out. He uh, went to the paramedics, talked to them, came back, and then we offloaded the patient. 
and took our equipment and put it to the side. And we were on our way back to the helicopter when the patient signaled us down, like called us back over there. And we didn't know what to expect. We were like, oh crap, what, what happened? You know, we didn't know what was going on. He uh, gave us a thumbs up and shook our hand and, and was able to, to muster out, thank you. It's a really amazing feeling, um, knowing that someone that's in so much pain and just having a bad night, and they don't talk the whole flight, they're, you know, they're still so grateful for what we're able to do and be able to express that. My name is William T. Meyer. I was born in Alaska, 1938. Now I was happy that the Coast Guard was here to uh, help me out. I was bleeding really bad all day long. And Guardian can't make it out on a snowy day. The Coast Guard could go out there all kind of weather. My heart goes out to those people. Men and ladies of the Coast Guard. Hey, I'm a stranger, you know, and you come and pick me up. You no, know, I'm really thankful for it, you know. got the call, we got uh, two kayakers that are stranded uh, just below the Columbia Glacier. They're stranded in the ice. The guys have dry suits on, uh, so the uh, cold water shouldn't be a factor for a while. Uh, it's about 60 miles northwest of here, straight shot. Because of the weather, we're gonna have to come around uh, Hinchbrook, come up into the Prince William Sound, and then work our way up to the Columbia Glacier. Once we get there, uh, we'll assess the situation, but like you were saying, Rob, we're probably looking at a direct deployment. Do not want to put you in the water, right? It's all the ice bumping around, smashing you up, right? So the concern was that we had two gentlemen in kayaks. They had become separated from each other. We knew that one gentleman had a radio. He was talking to Sector Anchorage and relaying uh, their distress. As far as getting the kayaks out and the rotor wash effects on the kayaks, that's something we're going to have to assess when we get there, right? Anybody got any questions about uh, where we're going, what we're doing, how we're doing it? Two kayakers, 60 miles northwest of here. We got 5,000 pounds of fuel, and uh, the plane's good to go. You know, we get a lot of out-of-the-box stuff, but uh, I've definitely never had kayakers stuck in an ice field before. And first thing that came to mind is they're like stuck in this little area, and the ice is closing in around them. How many millions of you know different scenarios can you think of in your head with that information? You know what I mean? And all right, talk about the mission here. This is something that we normally don't do, uh, especially for you, Rob. These guys can be in the ice. The main consideration here is we don't want you get injured by moving ice, okay? So I'm with you on that one. That's an elevator risk. I'm going to plot this position to see which bay we're going to go up to get there. It's, uh, it's rolling up over from uh, Valdez Arm. Gotcha. We took off from Cordova and were able to fly an abbreviated route there. Arrived on scene and uh, it took us a little while to find the kayakers. Kayakers, Coast Guard Helos 6044, Coast Guard Helos site. We were prepared for those guys to be hypothermic. They were getting wet, they were starting to get cold. Either one of you uh, wet or hypothermic and how's your supplies? We didn't have a really good picture of what they were facing because it's just crooked for all it's worth. Thanks, generation here is we don't want you to get injured by moving eyes, okay? So we took off from Cordova. We were able to fly an abbreviated route there. It took us a little while to find the kayakers.
luckily enough, we were able to hail them on Channel 16. We broke out of the ice. We're in open water. By the time we got there, they were already making their way out. They'd already seen an opportunity, and they were going for it. So, so we didn't have a really good, uh, we didn't have a really good picture of what they were facing. You know, it's a perfectly calm, beautiful, icy bay with about a billion and a half chunks of ice the size of buses floating around in it. You know. Tigers, Coast Guard Hilo 6044, Coast Guard Sight. What's your current plan? Our plan is to go down to Glacier Island. Over. Hey, Kayaker 6044, Roger. We'll fly that route to make sure this pass will be a kayak. Either one of you uh, wet or hypothermic, and how's your supplies? Our supplies are great, and the hypothermia disappeared once we broke out of the ice and started paddling like crazy. Over. Based on our initial call, we were prepared for those guys to be mildly hypothermic. They had good gear, but uh, still they were getting wet. They were starting to get cold. Once they got out of the thick ice flow and they were able to the paddle, they started to warm up and started feeling better. Maybe you can fly down to set point and check in with Bluff Lock and see if there's a route down there. It would take us about 45 minutes to get there, over. Roger, good copy, and uh, we're gonna fly the, the beach line. They call Bluff Lock. We had comms with the vessel on the east side of the ice flow. It turns out they were actually the charter service that was responsible for the kayakers. Bluff Watch 6044, are you guys able to make it to Flint Point? Um, I'm just looking at that. Uh, can you see how far up I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to go across to get through the ice? Uh, the ice is broken up across the bay here, but that's definitely a significant amount of ice in the bay. Okay, yeah, I can get over to Flint Point, I believe. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to go over to Glacier Island and come down through that way. So we maintain comms with that vessel and we're able to help them get through the ice flow, help them pick their way through the ice flow. It's pretty tight right there. Scott helicopter, did you just circle them? That's affirmative, we just circled them. Okay, I think I have a visual on them. Kayakers. This is 6044. Look left and you'll see uh, Bluff Watch. Because it's just trucking for all it's worth. They're pretty much in the good now. Uh -huh. They are really good, yeah. We were in a hover over both vessels and they looked to be close to each other, but they actually couldn't see each other being on the surface of the water. Kayakers have to look through and over uh, the ice field. We uh, luckily had really good radio communications and we were able to direct the vessel towards the kayakers. He's got it now. Coast Guard helicopter, yeah, I got him. Um, uh, we'll just put the bolts on board and go from here. Thanks. Bluff Watch 6044 is departing scene at this time. Uh, if you guys don't need any further assistance or uh, RTP this time. We don't like to leave scene until we're confident that the survivors are in a good situation and that the vessel has them. It's a relief to not have to deploy the swimmer to a dangerous situation and that the survivors were in great shape. That would be pretty bad to kayak around through here. That would be pretty fun. Yeah. Morgan comes out, you just whack him in the nose with your paddle. <laughs> bad, bad whale. Get out of here, Orga. <laughs>
Christina McRobert. With broken ribs, there's other things you have to worry about um, that maybe could puncture a lung, that it could um, impede the person's ability to breathe. There's just a bunch of things that go through your mind. What if, what it could be, and just prepare for what the worst situation could be. I don't know how far he fell. You know, I don't, I don't know if final is even a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's too many, too many unknowns, so I figured we'd just go and see what's up, and then I would come back to the plane. You guys are like three minutes in. My name is Nathan Figula. I'm an aviation maintenance technician second class here in uh, Air Station Kodiak. Once we got on scene, we did a slow hover taxi over the area. Me and the pilots started talking about uh, the best uh, location for us to do a rough air landing. Right in front of the road. Looks pretty good. As we're landing, it was pretty windy and there was snow. It was definitely one of the more confined areas that I've ever landed in. Once we got on deck, we let the HS out and the swimmer out, and they went and talked to the people that were, had four-wheelers out there that would give them a ride up to the, where the lodge was, where the, the gentleman fell. So hands every, every couple inches? Yep. When we got there, the guy was laying on the bunk, and we weren't sure what to expect, um, how he would be able to move or what would be most comfortable for him, so we had to kind of figure that out. What we have is a 65-year-old male non-ambulatory. We heard that the patient had sustained a pretty intense fall. We decided to also bring the corpsman along with our rescue swimmer to provide, you know, an extra level of care. Oh, oh geez, just a second, just a second. Oh. Oh, here. Right there we go. Perfect. There was lots of people to help that made it easier to get him out of the rack that he was in, and then we secured him in a stoke sweater and carried him down to the plane. It's on your tail. It was a little bit icy, so it's always a little bit of a challenge. Uh, in Alaska carrying somebody, you know, 100 yards down an icy pathway, but um, everybody did just fine and communicated well. So while they were up there uh, loading the patient, I was getting the cabin ready, you know, clearing out the area for the litter to be uh, set up. So once they got close enough to the aircraft, I caught them into the aircraft, making sure it was clear from the rotor arc and everything like that. Once we got the uh, cabin secured and the cabin door closed, caught the pilot up and uh, cleared the trees, and uh, we, uh, we flew back towards Cordia. You guys all ready to back? Yeah. Four takeoff checks complete. Okay. We're going to come up and back. Laying down was the most comfortable for him. Almost anything hurt him moving, so uh, we kept him laying down, tried to keep him comfortable. Four, zero, nine, 29. I'm getting it. The corpsman had everything under control. It took us about Less than 30 minutes to get uh, back to Kodiak. Uh, when you're in the bush of Alaska, you could only be 15 or 20 minutes flight away from town. But when the weather gets bad and maybe a medical condition warrants immediate response, it can feel like you're a 1,000 miles away. We really are their lifeline, especially in an emergency. Can you have them uh, have an ambulance wait? Roger. Uh, whenever we go out, there's a lot of variables that we have to encounter. So the combination of you know how kind of isolated the hunting cabin was with the fact that the weather was kind of closing in, it really made us the only source for help. When we returned to Kodiak, there was an ambulance waiting, and the patient was transferred and taken to uh, medical care. This was an extremely rewarding duty day. We were able to uh, save someone's life and uh, also encounter some professional challenges. So all in all, it was a great day.
Get set, go! My name's Dan Rohr. We're here for Kodiak Crab Festival today, and this is the survival suit race. They run down the ramp, they get to the bottom of the ramp, they put their survival suits on, there's zipper checkers there to make sure that they've actually got everything all zipped up. They get in the water and then they swim to the raft out there. Last year's time was one minute and 13 seconds. They're in the water, headed to the raft. Let's cheer them on. Two minutes, 2.23 seconds. I'm Jason Bunch from an aviation survival technician. We're here for the Kodiak survival suit race. 33rd annual survival suit race. We, we win it quite a bit, and everybody's watching, and everybody expects us to win, so I'm more nervous now than jumping into the Bering Sea. All right, team number two, Celeste, Sam, Jason, and Jeff, you guys can head to the ramp. The reason there's a four-man team is because a lot of the salmon saners, that's what they fish with. They fish with a four-man crew. And so the idea is to build as much reality into it as possible of what it would be like if you were actually on a salmon saner and had some kind of emergency situation. Racers, on your marks, get set, go! guys on as they get in their suits. Again, they have to have the zipper checker check them. Make sure they're all good to go. First man in the water, second man in the water. Again, they can go in either side of the raft. Uh, obviously, those last two swimmers in the water were faster than the old men that entered the water first in front of them. They're all piling in on top of each other. And hopefully, they don't sink the raft and they're out of the water. I'll well, have you a time here shortly. Good job. One minute, 8.8 .8 seconds. One, two, eight. yes! Survival suits have saved uh, hundreds of lives in, the, in Alaskan waters for Alaska fishermen and Alaskan uh, people, so we want to just continue to honor the safekeeping of the survival suit and the use of the survival suit in Alaskan waters, so that's why we do it, and we just love it. Next year, we'll win it again.